<laughs> so you have a you have a crazy story, an interesting evolution. You suddenly caught fire. Who is this Candace person? I really didn't plan to have this video be the first real content I upload to this channel. I've been working on a series of videos about the Milo Yiannopoulos book deal as a way to give everyone a look behind the scenes of the progressive publishing industry. But as a loyal and attentive subscriber to many channels in this so-called community, I felt very passionately that I wanted to talk about the Red Pill Black controversy. I promise I'm not being paid. This is not part of a funded misinformation campaign or a coordinated attack. As Red Pill Black said to Dave Rubin, I am honestly, I'm just, I'm just a girl that makes videos. I hope other people will see these, look at some of the links for themselves, and remain skeptical. I don't think there's enough information or evidence to prove one way or the other what Red Pill Black, aka Candace Owens, intent is with this YouTube endeavor and what her next steps are. But I think it's important to stay skeptical, and I think many of us just believed her story right off the bat, and it's only after Tree of Logic made a video that people started checking her story. As much as Candace talks about how she breaks the left's narrative, I think a lot of us forgot that she plays exactly into a narrative we'd really like to see. A young black woman realizing that the left is garbage and suddenly seeing the light and becoming an anti-SJW and conservative to boot. I first heard of her through Critical Condition, signal boosting her channel on Twitter. I watched her first couple of videos, thought they showed some promise, and then I watched her interview with Dave Rubin, followed her on Twitter, and kind of moved on. I didn't think too much more about her until I saw Tree of Logic's video about her. And while I do think that Tree can be conspiratorial and dramatic, I still feel she has good content and is earnest, so I decided to do my own research, which I had neglected to do initially. I saw a young black woman claiming to have woken up, and it often feels like an automatic win for those of us fighting identity politics to see someone using identity politics against the left. I normally click every link in an article and go deep into rabbit holes, but even I neglected to delve into this rabbit hole. Until now. If you're watching this, you probably know that last year Candace Owens, aka Red Pill Black, tried to get funding for a website called Social Autopsy, where people could submit people they know with screenshots of mean or offensive things they've said on social media, along with their personal information, linking them to their employer, schools they've attended, etc. I'm not going to spend too much time on the social autopsy website itself. I'll link below to Tree of Logic's video as well as Dave Cullen's recent video. There's so much more to question about Red Pill Black than what everyone else has already talked about, so that's what I plan to get into here. Chris Raygun and Dave Cullen made really good videos back in 2016 calling out the social autopsy website as the Orwellian nightmare that it is. It doesn't matter that she says the website never became fully functional. In concept, it's frightening, and her response to it is bent to dodge and just say, that's the past. I'm sorry, but you're new here, you're trying to build trust, and trust is what matters to a lot of people in this community. You don't have to say, I'm a bad person because I made it, but you should directly address people's very legitimate concerns. Candace either doesn't understand or is playing dumb about the fact that she walked into a community of creators that have an intricate web of devoted followers. I probably follow a wider range of people than most, people who may or may not be aware of each other's channels. These followers and subscribers have a high-level expectation for trust and transparency. A lot of people watched her interview on The Rubin Report, and he has a big, reasonable, liberal, left-leaning following, many who hate SJWs and PC culture and the Gamergate chicks. So her narrative was appealing to them, but they don't all listen to Stefan Molyneux or Andrew Clavin or Infowars or Paul Joseph Watson. And correct me if I'm wrong, but except for when she was on Alex Jones earlier this week, she never said that her anti-bullying startup was a website called Social Autopsy so that people could easily look it up. I've seen many people on Twitter wondering why people are freaking out now. People are freaking out now because they didn't research her. They heard anti-bullying startup and didn't connect it with Social Autopsy. So when people found out she was behind social autopsy and hadn't called it out by name, they got suspicious. I've not seen anyone go into Candace's past, at least not in any of the videos I've watched, but I did some research and I think her past is important to know when judging her now. So I'll provide links in the description for where I found a lot of this information and then I'll detail it for you right here. When she was 17 and in her senior year of high school in Stanford, Connecticut, she started hanging out with her boyfriend more than her close guy friend liked. This close guy friend got drunk, was driving around with some friends, and decided to leave her threatening voicemails, which included racial epithets and threats to tar and feather her family. She told a teacher who reported it to the cops, and because one of the boys in the car was the 14-year-old son of the governor of Connecticut at the time, the story blew up and she basically became known in local circles as someone who was a victim of a hate crime. 
Apparently, she said she received cyberbullying once this happened, though she never speaks about that at any great length that I could find. Even in the TEDx talk where she mentions it, she describes the cyberbullying as mean comments online that she saw posted on articles about her that she chose to read. She doesn't describe any violent threats she received beyond the initial voicemails that launched this incident. She clearly became a media sensation, but there's no evidence of what we would all consider to actually be cyberbullying or online harassment. This was clearly an experience that traumatized her because once she went to college, she developed an eating disorder that lasted for five years, which she spoke about in her TEDx talk. She said this was because she was worried about fellow incoming freshmen judging her who had read the news stories about her. This is why she developed the eating disorder. But she went to University of Rhode Island and everything happened in Connecticut. How many people from Connecticut went to her university that would even be aware of this? She even went by her mother's maiden name to separate herself from the whole incident. But she doesn't say if anyone actually judged her or was mean to her or gave her shit at college because of it. From what I can tell, it seems to have been her own mental issue. She also refers to this period during her interview with Stefan Molyneux as a bout of anorexia. And that's all she says, which seems a bit inconsistent with what she's written and said in her TEDx talk. And it's also like weird to gloss over that when her whole intent with social autopsy was to prevent the effect bullying has on kids and the effect she says it had on her, which it manifested in an eating disorder. So it feels very disingenuous to me. Then she worked in finance for a while and then left to start this anti-bullying startup, as she refers to it. She launched a company of what she was the CEO called Degree 180, which was a website designed to make the internet a nicer place to clean up the internet, quote, smart content for millennials. The website's still up. According to Wayback Machine, they launched in April 2015, though the site looked different back then and said they were a creative agency that was doing events and then just also happened to have a blog. Her editor-in-chief was quoted in an article saying, Freedom of speech is a very important thing, but I don't think it was meant to protect anonymous hate speech on the internet. Great. As the director of content for Candace's site, I think it's safe to assume what Candace's view was on this topic, at least as of March 5th, 2016, when the article was published. So then she launched the Social Autopsy Kickstarter on April 13th, 2016, and it was shut down the next day, April 14th, 2016, for a violation of terms of service. I'm not going to go over all the details of Candace's story um, regarding the infamous Zoe Quinn incident, as I'm going to call it. It's been covered already by her and by other YouTubers, so you'll find helpful sources in the description. In brief, she blames Zoe Quinn of Gamergate fame for unleashing an army of trolls on her and getting Kickstarter to pull her funding. So after her Kickstarter's funding got pulled and the Zoe Quinn incident was over, she went on a YouTube channel called The Ralph Retort and did two interviews with him 10 days apart. I haven't seen anyone talk about these interviews, so I really want to get into them here. The first happened on April 16th, 2016. Paul Joseph Watson has said that Candace talked about all this stuff in interviews if we'd only just go listen. So I did, guys. I'd already watched her on Ruben, and I went over that interview again. I listened to her on Stefan Molyneux, on Paul Joseph Watson, Alex Jones, Andrew Clavin, War Room, and Fox News. And then these Ralph Retort interviews, which were from immediately after the social autopsy incident. And the more I listened to her, the more her lack of substance and depth became really apparent. She explains on the Ralph retort that before they launched the Kickstarter, uh, they had consulted with high-profile anti-bullying organizations because they have been part of this collaboration with all these organizations. And even though these people had a bunch of initial questions, she soothed all their concerns. She said that when Zoe contacted her, she said it was on behalf of bullying organizations uh, that it contacted her and Candace didn't believe that. She wanted Zoe to name names. Meanwhile, Candace just keeps referencing these anti-bullying organizations she was connected to herself, but she never names names. She relates the story about the Zoe incident, which, if you've watched all her interviews, is incredibly slick and rehearsed. I'm sure it's partly due to personality and her experience of public speaking, as, you know, I said she gave a TEDx talk in the past, but it's still suspicious how rehearsed it is and how much she stays on message. When relating the story about the Zoe call in this interview, Candace said that she herself isn't that emotional, especially when the emotions don't make sense to her. She seems to be trying to paint herself as calm and rational, but comes off sounding like bitchy girls I went to middle school with who were very good at controlling the narrative and painting themselves as the victim. I truly implore you to listen to both of these interviews 
and tell me if you agree it sounds like she's playing the victim. Candace asks, uh, you know, why didn't we hear the word dox until Zoe contacted us? Um, because you're stupid and uninformed and didn't do any research on this topic before you tried to launch your company? I mean, don't get me wrong. I don't like Zoe Quinn as a human, but this is the crux of Candace's proof that Zoe directed the subsequent harassment at her because she didn't know what was a very well-known term at that point if you were concerned about online harassment. She also says, I don't give a shit about the gaming community. It doesn't affect my bottom line. Those are her exact words and really sounds like a true businesswoman to me. So in regard to the you're gonna ruin everything line from Zoe, if it's genuine, because reminder, we're taking Candace's word for it on how the phone call went down. It's possible that she was referring to minors being doxxed and that Candace's project would screw up the general anti-harassment support Zoe was working on with her organization Crash Override. So he explained to Candace on the call that she had been a troll when she was younger, which she gave a talk about, I'll put the link below, where she explains that anonymity is important because it provided her freedom to be herself as a closeted queer kid, which whatever you think of Zoe Quinn, that's true for many teenagers figuring out who they are and what they believe. Also, I think that allowing teenagers to submit their fellow classmates to this database, since submissions are totally anonymous, for everyone to look at, that's a goddamn recipe for enhanced bullying and humiliation, the exact opposite of what Candace says she's trying to do with this project. In any event, Candace has no firm evidence. She has emails between the two of them, which are in this super epic post she did about the whole incident, which I'll mention a little bit later, but the actual details of the call we're taking her word for. She admits to not knowing anything about Gamergate or who Zoe Quinn was before this incident, and all she does is talk about how pompous Zoe Quinn is and makes other such ad hominem attacks. This is a pattern with Candace. My brain is filled from all the ad hominems I heard her spew in these interviews. So she's firm with this in this interview, saying that she wants to include minors in this database, though not all of her employees agreed, and they've been discussing the issue amongst themselves. She also says you couldn't search by Twitter handle, only putting in names of people you actually know, so you couldn't look up some troll, find out where they live and work, and ruin their life. However, she never addresses the issues of security and potential for abuse. For one, she never addresses how easy it is to make fake Twitter screenshots, which I saw mentioned in another video about Red Pill Black, link below. Also, as was discussed in some Black Eyes live stream with Andy Worski and others on October 26, there was a thread online about the social autopsy site and the subsequent fall on Twitter back when this all happened, which I discovered a couple of days before that. I'll put the link below. So the people in this forum were pulling down her site and all the personal information from people that had been uploaded there. And this thread also has a bunch of screenshots of her tweeting from the official Twitter account for Social Autopsy, which was Social Coroner, because they had to move to that after the original Twitter handle got hijacked. It's protected now. The only thing you might see out there is this parody account that uh, looks like Social Coroner, but it's got a lowercase i instead of an L, which they capitalized to fool people into thinking it's real, but it's parody account. But the Kiwi Farms thread has screenshots from the real Twitter account when this is happening, and it's insane. Her reaction to this was insane. I will show you some of the best screenshots, but go look for yourself. It's insane. Another pretty important revelation in this video, I think, was that she claims that they have a big computer forensics company helping them. So now we have the biggest technology computer forensics company that is going to help us with this database, which means now it's actually a threat. Now you really could have your troll names unmasked. You know, so like she did, uh, she did nothing but help us in the end. Further, when talking about the Zoe thing, she shits on her, saying she's too busy to pay attention to things like Gamergate because, quote, I have real things going on in business. She also bitches that Zoe led with her resume when she emailed her, you know, saying you probably know me because uh, I was patient zero of Gamergate, essentially. And then Randy Harper, you know, wrote this Medium post and criticizing Candace's social autopsy and that she also leads with her resume in that post and then Candace says she doesn't want me to hit her with mine because she has not accomplished nearly as much as I have accomplished okay like I don't think they understand how accomplished women that I work with are I just don't think they do she also says they were getting constant emails until the instant she tweeted she was going on the record with the Ralph retort about what happened maybe true 
No way to tell. She says they're trying to actually make an impact on something that affects people's lives in the most responsible way possible. And said this. We're really transparent as long as, but we're not going to be responding to people that are just repeating the lies that were spread by a small malicious group of people. Yeah, that seems pretty consistent with how she's behaving now, despite this interview having happened a year and a half ago. So 10 days later, she's on the Ralph retort again. My favorite quote from this interview is also from the very beginning when she says, I'm a very honest person. L O fucking L. So in this interview, she discusses that Jesse Single wrote an article about her in New York Magazine that she dubbed a hit piece, but she never actually refutes anything Jesse Single said in the article during this interview. She just makes ad hominem attacks on him. She says he's not someone to look up to. She says this reflects badly on the Wasserstein family behind New York Magazine, and that it's sad to see him ruin this respected and revered family. She also says he's delusional and he's at this point, he, he's just unstable. He's not stable. He creates these block lists so that he can further delude himself into believing that he's a real person. Yeah. I don't know. Sounds like SJW tactics to me. Smearing other people, not responding to arguments and legitimate questions and concerns. All right. She said she was going to write a blog post about the whole incident on her Degree 180 website, which it looks like she did, but it's only on archive.org because she deleted it from the site. Link is below. As far as I know, it's the only post she deleted because the whole website is there with a decent amount of posts from her and other contributors. Uh, The post in question was deleted between September 3rd and September 22nd, 2016, according to the Wayback Machine. I'm not going to be able to really get into depth uh going over this article in this video because it would probably take me the length of an entire separate video to go over it but i will definitely put the link in the description below for everyone to read everyone should read it it's her whole story from start to finish about her zoe quinn conspiracy theory about how zoe quinn sent army of trolls after her and to get her kickstarter shut down it's really insane she even puts a photo of her with kids that she babysat for as proof that, you know, she loves kids and that this whole idea that minors are going to be doxxed was ridiculous because, you know, she was working with anti-bullying campaigns and her whole concern was for kids uh, because the tools of the internet make bullying way worse than it was in the past. And she did all her due diligence and Zoe Quinn is just this crazy person. People are welcome to disagree with me. Maybe they think Zoe Quinn was behind all of this. I just find that very difficult to believe and very convenient to her the victim narrative that Candace wants to paint. You know, she painted herself as a victim of this whole Zoe Quinn thing. Now she's painting herself as a victim because people are just trying to take down a black conservative, which is crazy because everyone wants to see more black people wake up, at least to the craziness of the mainstream media and how they lie. Maybe not everyone wants to see them become conservative because everyone's conservative, but the people in these community in this community, Dave Cullen is a conservative and he would be happy to see a black conservative. But you know, A, an actual conservative, and B, doesn't matter if you're conservative. You lied. You can't be trusted. And this whole community again is built on trust. And this article really makes me want to know how does she feel about cyberbullying now? Is she still doing charity work for children, for anti-bullying? How does she feel about bullying? How does she feel about free speech, hate speech, all of those things? You know, her TEDx talk, which happened a couple months after the Zoe Quinn incident, where she supposedly woke up conservative, was about quote-unquote digital activism and how people posting mean things on the internet was this problem. You know, posting a one-star review on Yelp because the waitress was you know, a bitch or whatever, or didn't serve them fast enough. She wrote this on April 18th. The Kickstarter was pulled down on April 14th. So which was the actual day when she, you know, woke up conservative? She says that she doesn't believe in online anonymity. She says, because if we were all publicly identifiable, it would be better because you wouldn't say terrible things to people. That ignores pretty obvious reasons that people would want to be anonymous, like even more innocent things like wanting to be anonymous on Twitter so you can share anti-SJW memes without getting fired or losing friends. That one's pretty close to my heart. 
She also says in this interview, quote, in this session, I have so many other things I'm working on. Right. Social autopsy is still happening. Um, so, um, and I have two huge announcements to make that you guys aren't even aware of. Okay. Um, so I didn't, I didn't want to become like a full-time blogger about this. But with that said, if anybody takes a swing at me and, and tries to dock my character and my reputation, I am not ever going to take that sitting down. That also seems pretty consistent with her response to everyone questioning her right now. She then goes on to address the Medium post by Randy Harper, saying that it wasn't well written, it wasn't smart, it was trashy, and again with the ad hominem attack, says she worries about Randy because she's genuinely messed up and has real issues to the point that it's really not funny. She also said to stay tuned because she and her team are working on a cyberbullying documentary. She does mention in this interview that Breitbart covered her fairly, but nowhere in either of these interviews with the Ralph Retort does she mention now having become a conservative or leaving the left or any of that. The views she expressed seem pretty far from conservatism. That brings us to the end of part one of my discussion of the whole red pill black controversy. Thank you for watching.